Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our presentation. Today it's a little bit different because we normally focus on academics so much when it comes to college. It, it's the first thing we talk about with our students. We want to make sure we find the academic match. And to be fair, it's the most important thing that they should be looking for, their education. But there's so much more to college and a lot of these factors are what kids really care about. So today we want to talk about the really broad topic of everything non-academic dealing with college. And I'm going to introduce Ms. Juarez to start us off um, with uh, the first part of this presentation. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, as Mr. Daniel is in talking about, are things like the academic fit, um, the student's major you know, area of interest. We talk about these uh, topics with our students every day. Um, we get into great detail. We won't be talking about internships or programs like that, networking. We won't be talking about career placement numbers, you know, how many, how many graduates get their a job within the first six months after graduation, that kind of thing. Rather, we'll be talking about a whole lot of other topics that are especially uh, close to your students' hearts and yours too. So the first one is a very, very important uh, factor and that is the location and lifestyle um, that a student has to consider when he or she is making his or her choices. Now we have to remember our students are, many of them are native Californians, right? Uh, they've been here for their whole life or a, a significant part of their life. So they're pretty spoiled. You know, they're, they're really spoiled about uh, things like climate and activities and being outdoors and things like that. So just a, a few things to kind of keep in mind, all right? Um, the location is vital. And just because a college does not come, you know, is, is not situated in New York City, Boston, Los Angeles, San Francisco. We have to remember that these lesser towns, towns that are not maybe well known, have wonderful colleges. One of our main focuses always is to have our kids be very open-minded to do their research, you know, to be willing to explore. So I'm thinking of one of our little gems that's not too far away, um, California Lutheran University, Cal Lu in, in Thousand Oaks. Thousand Oaks is a small, lovely town, yeah, and Calu is a great school. Now, in that town, Calutheran is instrumental to the community. They have their Scandinavian fairs every year, which are vital to the community. People travel from all over to come to the fairs. Um, they also have wonderful Shakespearean festivals every summer that uh, lots of people come to. They have a two or three plays each summer and there's beautiful picnic at night and things like that that they can uh, people can join in. Cal Lutheran has lovely pools and the pools are open to the public, swim lessons. They have lovely mountains behind the campus for hiking. The campus itself is lovely. So just because it's a small town, right, um, doesn't mean that it's not to be really considered, right? Because oftentimes a campus itself, a college is its own entity. And sometimes students don't even have to leave their campus very often because so much is right is right there on campus for them. Related to that is the, the idea of a big city versus a college town or you know, the college experience, that's a big buzzword, right? Well, our students have to be careful about big city. They have to really consider that. I mean, what is LA? Where is LA, right? Is LA Calabasas? Is LA downtown? Is LA the, the valley, right? Um, but when you get into onto some of these campuses, I'm thinking especially of NYU, you're walking around Manhattan, all of a sudden you're on campus. You know, so you go from right there, the subway and subway, not the sandwich shop, but the subway, you know, the, the train station, there's a number of them on campus, right? So a student has to be aware that if they're in a big city like that, the campus is sort of enmeshed right within the, the town itself. And that's very different. You know, Boston University is the same way. It goes, for, it goes for blocks and blocks. As you're walking in Boston, suddenly you're on the campus. Whereas a college town has a different feel, a different vibe. The college would be instrumental to that town as I was talking about earlier. And also our kids might not really know what a small town is, right? 
Um, being from LA has, has a very different idea about, about city life and where the city is. Probably one of the most significant elements of location and lifestyle is travel. And you, you and your student have to think about things like convenience and cost and how frequently are they going to come home. I'm thinking of Dartmouth. Dartmouth is located in Hanover, New Hampshire. And to get to Dartmouth, you always have two flights. There's always a layover. There's always a stopover. I don't know if it's 45 minutes or four hours. And then after that stopover, there's a bus ride, you know, for a good amount of time to get to the to Hanover, right? So you really have to think about um, the comfort level, how much time is going to take, the expense, things like that, when it comes to um, to to your location and travel. Is there a shuttle bus to take your student to the airport, right? Is there a shuttle bus to take your student into town if, if the college is a little bit more removed? Really, really important. We're right by LAX, right? We're right by, um, by uh, Burbank. We, we're, we're near a lot of airports and some college towns are not, you know? So that's just something to consider. Maybe also consider, are there family friends or are there relatives? nearby if they're going out of state to make you feel more comfortable if they don't want to come home for every holiday can they go to their their cousin's house on a thanksgiving if it's not going to work out for you that 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 year just really important to think about travel and plans and things like that um, another very significant part is the food right uh cafeteria very important typically as a college depending on how big it is we'll have one major cafeteria and then other smaller venues maybe they, they will have something like fast food restaurants or maybe they'll have coffee shops things like that but if and when we can get back on campuses and you visit a campus I would urge you to try to have lunch uh, in the cafeteria to check it out there are some cafeterias that have sushi bars and ice cream sundae bars and all kinds of ethnic foods and things like that and then other Others are much more streamlined without those kinds of choices. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. Also, students may be interested in, in checking out the restaurants in town if they want to get off campus. Kids need breaks for sure to get off campus and to, to visit the local restaurants. So you definitely want to evaluate the, the food and the food choices. You can typically have meal plans and the college will work with you. If you want 10 meals a week, I'm sure you can get it. If you want three meals a day, I'm sure you can get it. If you want your meals to roll over from semester one to semester two, you know, those are those are details that you can work out with your, your college of choice. But food is very, very important. Something else to consider, is there is there a little refrigerator in the room? You know, um, is there something like a kitchenette, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Along with restaurants, we want to know areas both on and off campus where students can just be with their friends or maybe a study group. Very popular in our modern libraries on campuses these days are our little study rooms that students can, can reserve, you know, for a couple of hours in an afternoon or whatever, and four, five, six people can actually be, I mean, this is pre-COVID, of course, uh, can be in there and, and study, right? Also, what about the off-campus hangouts? Right? Um, are there places where students congregate? Uh, are there places where they can meet up with friends? Again, kind of thinking about the breaks that they'll need. We mentioned a little bit about the outdoors. Our kids are so used to being outdoors year round. Today is February 24th. I think my car said it was 82 degrees, something like that. Um, so what, what's, what is it, what's available? Our kids like to hike. Uh, our, is there, are there water sports? Are there lakes and rivers around? It, can, can you do things like water ski and, and surf? Or what about um, winter sports? Is there snowboarding and skiing? So that's very important. And also maybe are there, are there school sanctioned activities? Like, is there a hiking club? Is there transportation to take your student to the particular area where they'll be hiking, et cetera? Um, something else regarding on campus is the facilities that are available. Are there gyms available to any students? What's the cost? Are they just for athletes? Are there, are there pools available um, for students, right? 
uh, you really want to see what what you get for you know the the price that you're paying and how convenient it, how convenient it is most people like to work out to some degree these days how convenient would it be to have your gym on campus instead of having to go off campus find transportation etc to go to um to an outside gym for example okay to continue we want to talk a little bit about housing now again california students are very used to cars right and you know everybody here our car i have to have my car i need my car well do you need a car if you're in a city like washington dc with the beautiful subway systems you don't need a car and also driving around washington and paying for parking and paying for fees to have your car on campus are all things that you want to keep in mind and consider um, because quite frankly you might not need a car right again that's that california mentality california equals car right you also want to, to be very clear on their on-campus housing policies oftentimes colleges require for freshmen at least maybe freshmen and sophomores to live on campus what if you want to live on campus all four years do you have that choice is that do you have that availability um what about if a campus is more of a commuter campus for us for example junior colleges community colleges are commuter campuses right they don't have they don't have dorms and residential buildings and also for for us in california many of our cal states i'm thinking of cal state northridge for example um a lot of kids are you know are pretty local who go to the a lot of the the cal state schools so they're more commuter campuses they do have residential dorms and things like that but a, a smaller percentage of kids go uh live on campus as opposed to a residential uh residential campus where most of the kids live on campus and then there's off-campus options mr johnson will talk about sororities and fraternities later but what about off-campus options is it easy to secure an apartment does your student want to live by him or herself is that feasible is it too expensive can they find a place for four or five friends um and would that have a kitchenette you know can they can they is cooking easy maybe they want to uh, supplement that with a meal plan there's all kinds of things to think about when you're thinking about housing and where you're going to live for four years and we know many kids stay longer or or come back to the town where they studied in when they get a little bit older just really important um topics to keep in mind our sh our shamana kids are used to school spirit we have a spirited campus and um, that that desire, that fun, that joy, you know, being in the cage and whatnot at uh, football, basketball games, maybe they wanna have that uh, on, on their, in their college experience too. So it's really tough to measure, you know, school spirit. We'll try to do a little bit of that as we move through here, but school spirit really matters, right? Um, does your student really want to be on a campus where there are games constantly maybe this student loves to watch women's softball boys sub men's soccer you know likes to really explore and watch um maybe they play we'll talk about that a little bit too um so what about the athletic teams is it d one two three uh what about accessibility to students do they get do they get to go to the games for free do they have like a package of 10 basketball games per season or whatever it might be, right? Something else to consider is the alumni work network. And my colleague, Mr. Borchert, uh, was, was talking to me about a really good example in USC. Um, on home football games at USC, the quad is, is devoted to alum and is filled with alum. Now, how exciting is that? To see that kind of spirit, to see that kind of support for a freshman, you know, coming to their first SC football game or other campuses too, of course, it, it really it really builds a feeling of community, especially if he or she is used to that. So school spirit and their mascots are are vitally important and can certainly add can accentuate the college experience. And we were talking about the difficulty to find uh, to measure school spirit. Mr. Johnson found this interesting um, chart here. So these are the top 20 colleges uh, in the country 
with high numbers of students who pack the stadiums. Now, we all know of number one and number two and number three, right? Those, those big schools with the big names and the big teams and all of that, we're all very aware of. Um, and you can see like 63,000 kids enroll or people enrolled at Arizona State. But check out number six, Xavier University in Cincinnati. It's number six on the Pack the Stadiums list. And look at, look at the, uh, the full-time enrollment, 5,000. Marquette and Creighton and, and UConn all have w small numbers. Well, UConn has 19,000, Creighton four, Marquette eight. Number seven, eight, and nine. These are big basketball schools that pack the stadiums and yet they're not giant schools. So again, keeping an open mind, we all can list the top 10, you know, basketball, men's basketball schools, women's softball, but we have to keep in mind that much smaller schools and maybe schools that you wouldn't think of as being well suited to you can also have vibrant, vibrant spirit life and sports life. Continuing in the vein of sports, okay, so again, we're not talking about D123, we're not talking about NCAA. So there are other ways to be involved, right? Um, the club level, if you kind of think about D1, 2, and 3 as the varsity level, if you will, the club level is more the junior varsity level, right? There's a commitment, but it's not, it's not to the extent that the, you know, the D1, 2, 3 players have to make. Um, it's, it's fun and teams, let's say there's a men's soccer team at your school, at a club team, that team will play other men's soccer teams, um, probably maybe not too far away. There's not a giant budget like there would be for some of the D1, 2, and 3 teams, et cetera. So club is an, is an awesome option, maybe for kids who played a lot throughout their lives, but don't want to, or, you know, just for whatever reason, they're not gonna they're not gonna play at the D12 level. Three club can be can be a wonderful outlet for them. Another one is intramural. An intramural is a little bit different. Let's say, for example, there are eight men's soccer teams at a given university on the intramural level. They would play each other, and they have they have championships and they have all the fun and whatnot that goes along with it. But again, it's, um, it's, not, it's not the commitment and it's just fun. If a kid just has always loved soccer or softball, whatever it might be, that might be a great way. You certainly meet a lot of people. Um, you, you keep in shape. You're very active in your club and intramural uh, sports. So really something to think about. There's, there's lots of ways to be involved in sports, even if you're not playing for the, the school's major team. Um, and then... A pickup sport and one that Mr. Johnson um, has chosen to kind of highlight in this presentation is Quidditch. You might not ever expect Quidditch to be a, a, a college sport, but it is. And of course, inspired by our, our Harry Potter series, um, there are actually Quidditch teams. And these are for purely for fun. But you can see that these, these major schools, Maryland, NYU, Michigan, Harvard, and Texas have uh, the top five Quidditch teams. So if your student has an, a niche, has a, a, maybe an, a, an interest that's not too mainstream, maybe he or she can actually start, start a team like Quidditch or something like that as they, um, as they enter and move through their, their college experience. And now I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Johnson. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the, the first part of the presentation, Ms. Juarez. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, relig religious affiliation and the degree at uh, these different schools. Uh, for the most part, schools are founded by governments and religions. And when you have a for-profit school, you, you kind of have to take a special close look at that kind of school. Um, and so just because of how they're founded, there are many schools that have a uh, religious identity to them. And so we have to find ways to navigate that because that could be really important to your student or it could be uh, something that the student's trying to steer away from. Uh, it's another difficult thing to try and measure how religious a school is. Uh, but there are a few things that can help you get there. One thing is the mission statement. And that's one of my favorite ways to uh, judge a school. 
Uh, if they have a mission statement that you agree with that really resonates with you, then honestly, it doesn't matter what the religion is if you are in line with what the school believes in. Um, when I first came to Shamanad, they didn't ask me if I was Catholic. They asked me about family spirit, you know, and that's, that really speaks to Shamanad. And you're going to find these same qualities across many different colleges and universities where they, they hold on to service, justice, and leadership or, or something along those lines. So try to look at the mission statement. Um, one other thing that you can look at is the student handbook. A lot of times those are filled with a lot of rules, but if you're a little bit worried about how draconian the rules are, um, you can actually look it up and find out um, what the punishment is if a student um, has alcohol in their dorm room or something like that. Um, then we have, uh, so there's a lot of different levels of religion in college, and you can kind of try to measure it as well by the classes that are offered or uh, the chapel requirements. Some schools will require that students go to chapel. Some will require that a student does something uh, sort of related to um, moralness. Uh, for example, Pepperdine doesn't have chapel, they have convocation, you know, uh, not specifically religious, but definitely um, moral in their ideas. Uh, and then uh, some other schools don't have requirements like uh, you have to take this religion class or you have to take a religion class about any religion. And so just by kind of figuring out these little details, you can get a good idea to how religious a school is. Because if your student just dismisses a school just because they're affiliated with the church, their options are gonna be cut down a lot. Um, and that's not what we want. We wanna find the right fit. And sometimes uh, that means that religious schools, they'll have to figure out how to navigate that. Okay, um, one thing that can be super important to school, uh, to students is Greek life or something similar. Uh, when looking at a school, uh, you're gonna wanna find out the percentage of the school uh, that's in Greek life, because that could reflect the social life of the campus. Um, for Greek life, some of it's allowed on campus. Sometimes it has to be off campus. That could change the dynamic of Greek life. Uh, if it's on campus, it might be more accessible to freshmen and sophomores. Off campus, you might find um, you know, juniors and seniors um, are the ones that kind of gravitate towards those. Uh, housing can be a big part of Greek life. Uh, the ability to live with your brothers and sisters in housing and have a special place, uh, that could be really uh, attractive to a lot of students. And many schools have, have Greek housing, but a lot of schools have said, mm, you can't have students living in Greek housing. It's caused too many problems. Um, and that's something you wanna keep in mind is that some aspects of Greek life have had problems. There've been sororities and fraternities that have banned from different schools and kicked out in controversies. And so take a look at those schools and find out uh, what their chapters are doing. Um, one thing that could differentiate the Greek life is uh, national for sororities and fraternities versus other social organizations. Uh, because just because they say we don't have Greek life doesn't mean they don't have some sort of social organization uh, that your students can get involved in. Um, and of course, uh, when you join a sorority or fraternity, you enter into an alumni network. And if it's a national network, you have friends and resources everywhere. Um, one little good example uh, we have here is this is Whittier College. They don't have uh, sororities or fraternities, but they do have societies, okay? So a student could easily dismiss Whittier, but then realize, oh, societies are like a really big part of the social scene. I should pay attention to that. Um, next, uh, for this example, this is the University of Alabama. I'm on the College Board website right now. Uh, if you go over to the campus life thing on the left, and then you scroll down to the bottom, you can see that it lists the percentages of Greek life. At the University of Alabama, 42% of women join sororities. That is a huge percentage, especially knowing that the national percentage of students that are involved in Greek life is 10%. Um, so you have to go, know going into this school that Greek life is going to dominate the social scene, especially if you're a woman. Uh, I like to think of it as anything over 33%, you know, is, is a very dominating force on the school campus. Anything between like 20 and 30%, uh, it's a pretty strong focus, but it's not going to be everything. And anything under 10%, or sorry, anything under 20%, like 15%, um, attendance in uh, Greek culture, it's going to be there, but it's not going to be um, the thing that everyone is talking about. 
But again, it's a hard thing to grasp. By the way, now that we're down at the bottom of this page, um, at the College Board website, they see the student newspaper right there. If you want to learn a lot about um, what is going on in a school, the school newspaper could be a good option. And there's a link right there um, while you're searching to the Crimson White. So you can read all about the University of Alabama and what's going on. Okay, one other, the next thing that some students might be interested in is study abroad or even college abroad. But we're gonna focus on study abroad right here. Uh, I studied abroad. I studied in London at Imperial College for a year and it was an amazing decision. My wife studied for a year in Florence and it was one of the best decisions of her life too. So I have nothing but good things to stay, say about study abroad. But I do wanna warn you about some possible uh, ways that students can get tripped up with it. Okay, um, so the types of program and the duration could be really key. Um, not every student wants to live somewhere else for a full year. So remember, there's usually year programs, semester programs, and sometimes there's even like two week or three week or six week programs, some of which uh, take place over the summer and get you extra classes and things like that. Um, sometimes the programs can be more important than the location. And that's because uh, you can study abroad in a few different ways. The first thing is that almost every single college has study abroad. They just have relationships with other universities in other places, and they promise to transfer the credits. So basically your student is just enrolling as a sophomore or a junior, brand new at the University of York or you know American University in Dubai or something like that. Uh, that's, that's not a lot of support. They're just a brand new transfer student in. And yes, there might be uh, some programs there to help them out, and you're gonna wanna research them and find out what kind of support is there. But sometimes that can be a big step for a lot of students, pretty intimidating to just be in a college. Um, then the other level, the other type of program that it could be, is it could be designed by a company where companies usually build their own cohorts. And sometimes they get it all from the same college, but most of the time they grab students from a bunch of different places, create a support system, and then they all go to college. That can be really interesting too, especially if you're meeting a bunch of friends from a bunch of different places and you're meeting friends uh, at the university that you're now enrolled in, uh, could be very cool. But companies are companies and sometimes they do a great job and sometimes they don't. So you're going to want to do a lot of research on that as well. And then finally, some colleges just literally pick up their college and a bunch of their students and then bring it to another country and then set it down. Uh, that's actually the program that I went to in Pepperdine. They, even though I went to some classes at Imperial College, they had their own classrooms, imported, brought over some of their own Pepperdine teachers, got some teachers from somewhere else. Um, I had classes with just Pepperdine students. And when I went up to my room upstairs, you know, I was around and had roommates of other Pepperdine students. Um, so that was a very safe and easy way to do study abroad because I had my own cohort. Um, sometimes you can look at the housing and figure out what type of program it is or what kind of support you're gonna have because most of the time is gonna be downtime. So if you're in a homestay, you're actually staying with a family. That is big immersion. And uh, some students have given me feedback and saying it's the best experience of their lives. They found a second family. It's amazing. Other students have felt like um, they didn't really vibe with their new family and they, they didn't like it very much. So uh, that's, I think that really depends on your student. Uh, there's normal campus housing. You know, uh, you could be paired up with a roommate from that country. That could be pretty cool, but again, very immersive. Uh, sometimes there's just private housing where this org company or organization or college literally like rents you an apartment. <laughs> uh, so then you're really in the city, but you might be a little bit disconnected from the other student population or even your other um, people. And then another thing would be cohort housing where you get a group of kids that are all in this program and then they all live together. And then you have a lot of the support system of everyone else in the program. Okay, so one way to break down study abroad and figure out a little bit more about it is by looking at schools that do study abroad. Um, this is Goucher College. Uh, they're near Washington, D.C. on the East Coast. Daniel, you're muted. There we go. Um, Okay, this is Goucher College, and Goucher College uh, is located in Maryland near Washington, D.C. They pride themselves on their study abroad program. 
and they make everyone, unless you have a very special situation, study abroad. They're like, it's a part of our curriculum. Uh, and so they have hundreds of study abroad programs and they actually are use all of these different things that I talked about. Uh, so if you look at their, you could literally look at how they do it. And I'm not saying Goucher College is a good fit for all of your students, but you could see how they're running their programs and then say, oh, like I now have a point of comparison for this new university, how they do it. Because if you ask about study abroad, they're all going to say yes. And they, and the person that's talking to you might not have all of those intricate details of how they do study abroad. Um, so looking at schools that do it well can give you an idea of what is out there. Uh, by the way, the University of the Sunshine Coast, you could study in Australia and you can tell people you went to USC and look, there are, there are kangaroos hopping around campus. What, like this could be your life anyway. Um, but literally there are, you can go almost anywhere and the opportunities are endless. Uh, one other way to figure out about um, study abroad programs is participation. Is this a thing that everyone does? Uh, this is Pepperdine again, 80% of the students study abroad. Not required, but 80% go. So if you have strong participation, it means that you have a robust program and there's a lot of support there. Uh, okay, let's talk about activities outside of your major. So this is about being involved in things uh, that you aren't directly tied to. Um, and this is really normal in high school. You can be a part of the play and not be in drama classes all the time. Like you can, uh, you can play instruments and not always be in the specific music classes. But sometimes at college, your access to being in the play is severely limited if you're not in their theater program. Uh, you can't really just hop into the band unless you are a music major in some schools. Same thing goes with journalism or art facilities or athletics facilities. We mentioned that gym that you might not have access to a little bit earlier. So one thing that you might wanna do is find out, well, what, how involved can you be? Um, again, back to my college experience, cause you know, I'm here to live vicariously through your kids. Uh, I was a part of the journalism. I wasn't a journalism major, but I wrote for the newspaper and I was the art editor for the newspaper. But I found out that if I wanted to be a more important editor, I really couldn't compete against the other journalism majors. I just wasn't gonna be selected. Um, they felt like I didn't have the background to do the job and may maybe I didn't. Um, but that was a little bit disappointing that I couldn't really move up into the ranks because I wasn't the correct major. And in some cases, they, you know, in drama, they might not even be able to get the parts at all. Uh, and that could be frustrating them. Of course, on the other side, there are some schools that pride themselves on saying, you know, our, band, our school band is literally cobbled together from everywhere and from tons of different majors. Uh, okay, diversity. Uh, people are really what makes college special. So it could be good to look at where the students come from, find out how dynamic that population is. Uh, and then also like look for programs and places where your student can fit in. You really want to find a home, uh, and that could be those intramural clubs. You know, it could be Greek life. It could be some of those programs that you're interested in. And setting yourself up and your student up for success uh, is going to be really, really important because it's very easy in a lot of these schools to stay in your dorm room because it's kind of hard to put yourself out there, especially if you're in a brand new situation. Uh, there are schools out there that do a really good job of pulling students out of their dorm rooms and getting them to do things and getting involved. Uh, but it can help a lot to make students happy and successful if they can find a home and be a part of one of these types of programs. One thing I also want to mention is that as you're going through, as you're trying to find all these non-academic matches, uh, colleges are advertising to you. Uh, I know that we're very adept at this point in time in society to identify advertising and kind of look through that, uh, but advertising works. And it's one thing that we always want to keep in the back of our heads. And it sometimes feels like they're not advertising to us. So remember, whenever you're doing your research or looking up stuff, you're always seeing the best side of something. If they ever show you a dorm room, you're seeing the very best dorm room that they have. <laughs> All freshman dorm rooms stink. And if they show you a dorm room, it's going to be like the senior honors dorm room, things like that. Um, one thing, for example, we were at uh, Berkeley and they showed us this beautiful gym, just gorgeous, brand new facility underneath the stadium. 
Uh, yeah, that's for athletes only. Yeah. Um, one thing again at Berkeley, uh, same same tour, a student of ours at Chaminade asked a beautiful question. Uh, they were worried about Berkeley's downside, which is that they have uh, really big classrooms and very prestigious faculty that care about their grad students more than their undergrad students. Um, so knowing this, our students said uh, to the person, hey, what's it like dealing with uh, grad students all the time instead of really your professor? You know, what can you give us some feedback about that? Great question. An even better answer from this student tour leader who's trained to answer this question. Uh, she said that it was a perk that she could identify with the grad student. That the grad student taught her to her level and was uh, more available than the professor and that smaller groups were more intimate uh, and she was far more likely to talk to her grad student uh, than the professor. And she spun it in a way that sounded like great advertising to me, but made it sound like the downside wasn't so bad and that it was actually a good side. Um, one other thing right here, I love the University of Washington. It's great, it's beautiful. But did you know it rains all the time? You will never find a cloudy picture um, on any of their materials at all. Look, you can see Mount Rainier all the way in the distance in this beautiful clear day with cherry blossoms and, and sun flare across like students, uh, lens flare and these beautiful sunsets. And that's gonna be the situation for every single school. You know, they're always going to show you the most beautiful things, all of the, the wonderful pictures. Again, I don't want to harp on Berkeley, but this is another thing. Um, this happens actually a lot of UCs and uh, Cal States where they have some buildings that are cement block boxes and are dingy and run down. And they have others that are brand new and state of the art and amazing. Where do they take you on the tour? They take you through the brand new amazing facility that has a dinosaur skeleton mounted in the center where all the students are going in their labs and cool things and, and workspaces for everyone. It was amazing. Um, but you look over there and there's also another building that's you know just a concrete block. So uh, that's another way. Remember, you're always being advertised to. It's always a part of the, of the equation. So, We've talked about a lot of these different qualities that you look for in a college, uh, but it can be a little bit difficult to figure out how you get those qualities out, especially when you are being advertised to. So, you know, everyone's gonna say, oh, we have the most amazing study abroad program, but it's hard to like pull out those details about, well, what about it? Tell me more. Or, you know, they say Greek life is amazing, it's, but it's not required to be a part of Greek life. That's gonna be their answer no matter where you go. How do you figure out all that information? So there's a few places that you can go for research. Naviance, first and foremost, it's actually the best tool for Chaminade specific academic data uh, because it measures our Chaminade students. So that's great. Uh, then if you go online, there's tons of different places to search. I personally like the College Board. It's just a good search tool. I showed you that before with the University of Alabama data. Um, it's good. It's unbiased, but it definitely does have fewer features and is less flashy than some of the other schools. Um, what I mean by unbiased is uh, actually, if we go all the way back in time to one of Ms. Warriors' slides about um, these packed stadiums, uh, you can see that some of these places will have these like featured schools, it's like featured school, featured school or sponsored school, or will push schools to the top of your list or the top of your search results. I, I dislike that because that's advertising uh, and they're getting paid to highlight these specific schools. And same thing with these like little request info buttons that they have here. Um, so just remember when it comes to schools, a lot of the times uh, these places are advertising to you. Um, so that's why I like the College Board. School websites, they're gonna have really relevant sources. Um, niche, uh, basically this is a place where they gather together information about schools but it's kind of like the Yelp for school reviews where they get a bunch of different data and anecdotal information from students and from people that have been there and all sorts of stuff. Um, I've seen a lot of really bad reviews on Yelp. <laughs> Whenever you uh, start gathering data from the public and it isn't cultivated, you end up with really highs and really lows. And people that just had an okay time don't really um, sign up to write a review. So, and they can be misleading. So um, take that information and use it, but use it well. That's actually why we like uh, things like green resources like Colleges That Change Lives. 
they're they've actually gone through and got 40 different schools that they believe have this extra quality, this quality of student life and student engagement and support of students. Uh, and they write about it anecdotally. Um, they, there is a reason why this book has millions and millions and millions of purchases and people still look at it today. Um, but of course, that can be hard to get. I'm not saying that those 40 schools are a good fit for your student, but that approach and understanding the whole aspect of a school is important for your student. Um, so really quickly, I'm going to um, switch gears and show you a little bit of research um, and, and sort of show you how we could theoretically go about uh, researching some of these schools. So let's go. All right, there you go. Now you're seeing my, there we go. Now you're seeing just the internet and uh, you, this right here is the College Board. So if you click on, this is the big future. By the way, College Board is the people that do the SAT and APs and stuff like that. So if you go over here and do search for colleges, uh, they'll bring up a, just a big old college search where you can type in like the type of school, for example, four-year schools, private schools, eh, medium size in California. Now let's do, yeah, let's do California. Um, and then literally you can find all of the schools in California of that size. Um, and go ahead and click on them and they'll take you to some more information. So there's Occidental College and it'll pull up that same thing you, we saw about the University of Alabama and stuff like that. Um, and then from here, you can kind of figure out some more information about different schools. And sometimes if you just dive in a little bit, you can figure out if a school would be a good fit for some students. Um, I have a case study right here. This is the City University of New York City College. So this is located in New York City. This is less than a mile away from Columbia, okay? Uh, so right there in a very <laughs> highly uh, exciting place for students to be. Uh, it's a public school. The Actually, you're gonna pay more out of state, but it's not that expensive, under $20,000, okay? Um, it's actually, if we look at it, the uh, academics, it's quite selective. They turn down most of the students that apply, but a student with a 3.0 can easily have this be a target school for them. So there's a lot of things about this school that could attract a lot of students. Um, but I think if we go over here to the campus life, we might have a little bit more information that could find why our students aren't applying to this school as much as others. Um, it's a commuter campus. So that means that a student can't live on campus here. Or, or camp, on-campus housing is gonna be really limited. Uh, does that mean they're gonna have to find an apartment in New York, in Manhattan? Like, where? how are they gonna navigate all of this? Do they have friends out there? I, I, it just becomes a little bit tricky. And also, how many things are going on on campus? You know, if it's a commuter campus and everyone's uh, going home and then driving into campus, and then when their class is over, they leave again, is there gonna be that social life? Is there gonna be that extra something there? The average age is a little bit older. Um, and so that just means that they're more likely to leave campus. Uh, a 27 year old, which is the average age, is not gonna hang around with an 18 year old um, on campus. They're gonna, they're gonna leave and go to their job or something like that. If we look at in-state and out-of-state, 98% of the students that attend here are in-state, 2% are out-of-state. Okay, that's, that's a big indicator right there is if, if your student's gonna fit in, you know? And I would, I would counsel students that you might not fit in here. You know, you have to be a very special student to want to be in a commuter campus, even if you're in New York City, even if you're in one of the most desirable places where students love to go, um, but their options are limited, you know. So that's just a little bit of a, of a case study to give you an idea of how something can look really good on the surface, but then when you think about student life and day-to-day -day stuff, um, it can be you can find out that it's not bad, but less and less um, general. It's more specific to the type of student that's gonna be interested in this type of school. Um, for example, uh, these, this right here is Mish. And uh, if we look at the best student life, 
Uh, USC is apparently number one. I don't know what their metrics are, um, but you can read up to like almost 4,000 reviews about USC, 5,000 reviews about UCLA. That might be too many reviews to read. Um, and again, sometimes it might be anecdotal and overwhelming and it's, it's a little bit difficult to figure out what's going on. Um, so this is a resource, but again, um, I think you should take it with a grain of salt. Uh, and then this is the website for colleges that change lives. You can see the 40 schools here. Uh, they don't tell you all the information about it. They kind of want you to still buy their book, but um, you could literally just look at these schools on the list and try to find out what makes them special. And I have to agree. I look at a lot of these schools and I think that they're great. And a lot of them are these hidden gems that really care about teaching. They care about students. They care about student support and getting them involved. So I, I, I love this list of schools, but more importantly, I like the approach that they go through, trying to find that X factor. Um, and of course, if you really want to find out stuff, you can go onto the student websites. This is the USC website. You're going to see right here that literally uh, their belong, participate. Uh, they have list of the hundred student organizations they're part of. This idea of equity and inclusion, arts and culture, Greek life, service, uh, Trojan athletics, athletics that are not, you know, the NCAA athletics, religious life, student government, you know, need programs, veterans, uh, events calendar. You can see that a lot of the stuff that we talked about, big schools like UC have already said to students, hey, these are the elements of campus life. Like, look at them, look at what we do here. You know, and so you can see there that other schools are, are really valuing um, these details as well. Okay, that is the, the presentation.